But as we start out this morning, I want to ask the question, uh, how do you define greatness? What is greatness in your eyes? And in honor of Father's Day, uh, we're going to hear from one of my favorite, most manly television uh, characters who perhaps gives us a place to start. This came in a tube this week, and I tried to flatten it for like six days. I just can't. This is uh, Ron Swanson's Swanson Pyramid of Greatness from the great TV show Parks and Rec. And just, just to kind of start us out, let me read a few things that Ron Swanson thinks are great. Kind of down at the bottom, we have rage. One rage every three months is permitted. Try not to hurt anyone who doesn't deserve it. Uh, We have skim milk, but it says, that's right, it's on here twice, avoid it. We have buffets, cow protein, pig protein, chicken protein, deer protein, and fish, parentheses, sport only. And at the top, it says, honor, if you need it defined, you don't have it. Ron Swanson with some strong words. I was thinking a little bit more through the lens of social media and pop culture and what we have on our TV screens and who seems to develop a following in today's world. Maybe there's something we can learn there about what people consider greatness to look like. Some of the things I came up with as I reflected on those individuals are it seems like those who are beautiful people are, also, are often considered amongst those who are great. Or maybe even if they aren't beautiful, those who can produce great works of beauty, whether it's through the arts or music or creation, creating things. Uh, those who are very skillful, very talented, are often considered great. Those who are uh, really um, productive, those who can help our lives become easier. Think about like our great inventors, like Steve Jobs, who gives us through Apple the iPhone and the iPad and ends up writing books about leadership and how to live life. Those who are wealthy and powerful are often considered amongst those who are great. Uh, I, I can think of a few individuals who at this point, you know, pretty much are famous for being rich, and yet that seems to have gotten them a bit of a platform. And then, of course, on a more base level, those who are funny, those who are entertaining, can sometimes draw a crowd to themselves just with those abilities. The reason why we're looking at this question today, what defines greatness, is because it is one that threatened to divide the Corinthian church, the church that was the recipient of the letter that Kevin just read. And I believe it is still a relevant question for many of us still today. We'll consider what Paul has to say through 1 Corinthians 13 about this question of greatness in just a moment. Uh, But as we prepare to study God's word, would you join me in a brief, brief word of prayer? God, we thank you uh, that we have this chance to be together with you on this beautiful day. We thank you for Father's Day and for uh, the various men who have played the role of father in our lives, whether those are our biological fathers or other men who have mentored us and loved us well. Uh, We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a good father who doesn't leave us in the dark, but through your word, through your son, through your spirit, you reveal more and more of yourself to you that we might, or to us, that we might know light, that we might know love. I pray for uh, families in this, this, this congregation today who are preparing to send kids to Wildside this week for middle school camp, that that would just be a meaningful thing for those students, that they'd have an incredible week, uh, and that also they would have the opportunity to meet you personally, to spend some time with you, and to sense maybe where your plan for them begins, that they would also sense how deep your love for them is. Help us to be all ears as we look at your word this morning, whether this is the 30th time we've heard this passage or the first. Our desire is to leave this place looking more like you, so speak to us. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite our welcome team forward now. I've got a welcome team making their way. We've got some time here, but we're not going to reread this whole passage. So if you'd like a Bible this morning, they're going to be bringing them up. I'd encourage you to take one because I'd love it if you're kind of looking along as I kind of move through these verses a little bit more quickly. Of course, you can do that with a Bible you brought from home. You can also do it on the Church Center app. Just flag down Jake or Aubrey as they're walking through. If you'd like one of the Bibles, you can bring it back next week if you'd like. You can take it home with you, or you can leave it here today and borrow it every single week, whatever floats your boat. If we haven't met before, my name's Drew, and I serve as the campus pastor here at Heartland Williams. It is so good to be with all of you today. Jake, that's very good modeling of those Bibles there. You caught my eye as I was sharing. And uh, as we consider for a few minutes what Kevin just read for us, I do want to set the scene a little bit for this letter, because we are quite literally reading someone else's mail. 
So first of all, as I already mentioned, this is a, a letter that is going to the church in Corinth. And so we've got our kind of visual display here that we're going to be using throughout the summer. As you can see, the letter to the Corinthians, Corinth is a city in the south of Greece. It's a little distance away from uh, Rome, where we saw a letter last week. Corinth at this point was a city within the Roman Empire, and it's just important for you to know that this was a strategic and important city important for the economy, important for the, the military. It was a very diverse city. Uh, there were Jews there, there were Greeks there, Gentiles there, a whole lot of people there. This is not a small city. And this letter was written in around A.D. 53. Paul, who wrote this letter, the great missionary of the early church, he actually planted this church himself just a couple years prior, sometime between A.D. 49 and 51. And so we're talking all around, right now we're talking all about uh, basically 15 years removed from the events of Jesus' teaching ministry when he was doing miracles and traveling with his disciples and ultimately dying on the cross and being resurrected to save all people from sin. So we're about 15 years removed from that. One thing that's really interesting to me is when I picture these letters, this is just me, maybe you don't have this problem, uh, I usually picture like, hey, it's probably a good size group of people that Paul's writing this letter to. But in my studies this week, there's actually a good chance that this church in Corinth is as small as about 50 members. And remember, Paul planted it just two to three years earlier, so like he knows these guys. He knows their names, he knows their families. They actually didn't really gather in a building like this. They typically met in homes, and that's because they were not an officially recognized religion. And so they weren't able to gather publicly in a big building at this point. They'd meet uh, more locally in homes. One other interesting thing about the lead letter, and I should say letters, to Corinth is that we have two letters to the church in Corinth in our Bible, First and Second Corinthians. There are actually at least four letters that Paul wrote to this church, and we don't have all of them. So the first letter uh, is actually not what we call First Corinthians. He's addressing some reports he's heard about issues in the church. In the second letter, which is what we call First Corinthians, he is now responding to some news that's gotten back to him about issues in that church, and this is kind of cool, the Corinthian church has written him a letter. And so if you were to read this letter this week, you'd realize he says, now about the matters you've written to me about. We're just reading reading one side of this uh, conversation by mail. The third letter, which we have lost, we don't believe we have copies of it, is called Paul's Tearful Letter. And so basically what happened here is between 1 Corinthians, writing that letter, and 2 Corinthians, he went and made an emergency visit to the church in Corinth because things had gotten so ugly and bad that like, he had to go straighten things out. And in the time he spent there, he was either deeply insulted or actually injured by a member of that church. And so it left, that, that meeting ended with him rushing out, leaving kind of like with serious problems there. So the idea of it being a tearful letter is he wrote back to the church really sharing pain of how he had been treated, about how unsuccessful his visit had been, trying to straighten things out. And then finally, we have the fourth letter, which we call 2 Corinthians, it's in our Bible, where he is now defending himself. Some had used that opportunity of his bad visit to say, hey, Paul, he wasn't really all that great to begin with. You should be going this way, not Paul's way. And so he, he does a bit of defending his reputation uh, in that letter. He does a bit of um, talking about his plans, but because some had said, well, if he really cared about you, he would have come and visit again. And he tries to explain that. And then finally, he talks about this offering that a lot of the churches Paul had planted were going to bring to the suffering church in Jerusalem. So in other words, Paul is actually working with these churches to collect money for a church down here that's struggling. They were already beginning to pull together. Now, that might be more context than you wanted, but I think it's helpful because these letters, according to those dates, are like 2,000 years old. And we don't have a ton in common with those churches and with what was going on. One last thing we need to remember any time we read the letters is, um, I stole this from someone else, but the, the letters can kind of be like really good Twitter theology They've got all these great verses in the letters that, like, you can put in 140, 280 characters. They sound great, really practical, tell you what to do, and that's good, but 
we miss a lot when we take them out and use them as tweets and don't do the hard work of digging into what was like the specific thing that Paul as a pastor and missionary who knew these people really wanted to address. So that's what we're going to try to dig into today. In this particular case, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems. The Corinthian church has a bit of a reputation for probably being Paul's like most unruly church. And the specific issue in 1 Corinthians he's dealing with is they are getting divided over a variety of different issues. Some of them are, are really strange issues to us. Like there were divisions being formed about um, whether or not we should eat meat that had previously been offered in pagan temples to idols. And some were saying yes, and some were saying no. Division. There were issues of division related to sexuality. Some really gross stuff was happening in that church, and you can read about it if you want in the book. Division. And then finally, there was significant division taking place over worship, like over a gathering just like this and how things were happening there. With that in mind, this is all going to tie into this question, how do you define greatness and what makes someone great in the way the Corinthians were answering it? Let me ask you a question. Where do you most often hear this passage that Kevin just read? Weddings. Great. That's exactly what I was counting on. Good job. You were reading my notes. Weddings. And not just weddings that we go to, but even like major TV weddings, like on big deal shows. Check this little clip out. Love suffers long and is kind. It is not proud. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So even on The Office, like an Emmy award-winning TV show in its ninth season, I believe, you know, that's the Bible being quoted on national TV. However, did you notice anything different between what Kevin read and what was read at Pam and Jim's wedding? No, you didn't notice any differences. Okay, different words, like different translation. Here's what I'm going for. There's a whole bunch of what Kevin read that was left out of that office episode. And to some degree, it's like what we see starting in verses one to three, where if you were to read verses one to three at a wedding, you might be like, oh, this doesn't feel like it was written for a wedding. You know, like, let's just get to the good stuff in verses four to eight. And that's because it wasn't written for a wedding. And I just want us to see that. Like, it's not like Paul made a mistake. It's not like we were being clever editing that out at weddings. It's just that Paul's actually addressing a church. We're jumping into the middle of a conversation. And one thing that's really helpful for us is to just back it up one more verse into the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12, which says this. Paul concludes that chapter with, and yet... I will show you the most excellent way. So 1 Corinthians 13 is a picture of the more excellent way that addresses the situation in 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking all about these spiritual gifts, gifts given uh, by God through the Holy Spirit to individuals who are following Jesus for the building up of his church. And what was happening in the Corinthian church is that they had all these gifts, and some of them were gifts like prophecy, sharing a word from God, speaking in tongues, which could refer to a speaking supernaturally in languages you didn't know to proclaim the good news, or it could refer to a private prayer language that an individual had to express themselves with God. Gifts of healing, gifts of miracles. And what the Corinthians were doing is they were saying, hey, those gifts, especially speaking in tongues and prophecy, if you've got those gifts, like that's your ticket straight to the top of church leadership. We think you are great. But on the flip side, if you had, let's say, teaching, or the gift of serving, or showing mercy, or hospitality, well, you know, those are okay, but man, did you see that guy speaking in tongues? Let's get him up front every week. Let's give him the number one badge. They were turning the spiritual gifts, and specifically those gifts, into signs of greatness, and division was thus being caused by this faulty view of what makes people great. 
So what Paul essentially accomplishes here in verses 1 to 3 is to say the spiritual gifts, even speaking in tongues and prophecy, which are really cool, they are nothing without love. There's no greatness to be had without love. We arrive at verses 4 to 8, and that's kind of the good stuff that we all know. That's what you hear at the wedding. That's what's, you know, the nice thing that you can kind of write in your, your uh, Father's Day card. It's great. And, and so what's cool about these verses is they define love, and they define true greatness clearly. They also define God. They describe God, I should say, and his character, because 1 John 4 tells us that God is love. So if this is a true description of love, it's also a true description of God. We'll say more about these verses, but we're going to come back to them in a little bit. We get then to verses 8b, the second half of verse 8 to 13, and, and that's where essentially we find our big idea for today, which is that the greatness of love never fails. The greatness of love never fails. Paul says into the situation, hey, Corinthians, these signs of greatness that you've created, these marks of greatness, the way you're defining greatness, those are going to pass away. He says in verse... Uh, Eight and nine, that hey, a time's coming where prophecy, speaking in tongues, those aren't going to be needed anymore. Those are going to fade away. And he says that time will come when completeness comes. What he's referring to is when Jesus will return to fully usher in his kingdom, to establish his kingdom where he will invite all who've come to join his family to live and reign with him eternally, to live in his love forever. And he explains why we won't need speaking in tongues and prophecy anymore then, because God, who now at some level is a mystery to us, will then be face to face when Jesus invites us into his kingdom. We won't need that person speaking in tongues to explain something that we're missing because we'll see Jesus. And what's really wonderful here is Paul kind of gives us this little teaching that maturity grows as we see God more clearly. Ultimately, we will only see things truly as they are when Jesus returns and we abide with him forever. And we have this final great verse. On the flip side, those signs of greatness will pass away, but three will remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That's how we can say that the greatness of love never fails. But my gut is, if we just quit here, if we tie this in a bow here and walk away, although that seems like a nice, cute, big idea for Father's Day, none of our lives are going to look very different. And I know that because when I got married in 2016, we had a lot of guests at our wedding, and and so, you know, people brought us gifts that we didn't register. We got a lot of wall art, guys. A lot of well-meaning wall art and frames. Some of those just immediately got passed on to other deserving couples. Um, One that made the cut is we have this really nice, like, I don't know what it is. It's it's like a wooden deal that has 1 Corinthians 13 on it. It hangs right above our bed. I did the math. I've conservatively slept under the verses we read this morning 2,100 plus times at this point. And yet, am I 2,100 times more loving I don't think so. I think that's my son. I love him very much. I'm sorry if he's distracting you. Um, Am I 2.1 times more loving since I hung that wall art up? I I don't know. We'll have to ask God someday. That's not the point. The point is, I don't think familiarity with these verses or lack of familiarity is our problem, just based on my life. These are verses that we know. They're verses you know even if you watch The Office but haven't gone to church in three decades. I think our problem is more that we are all flooded with rival visions of greatness. The world, the devil, our own desires, social media, pop culture, your coworkers, advertisers, they are constantly suggesting other definitions of greatness than love, meaning that every single one of us faces a personal struggle as we answer the question, how do we define greatness? And so with the remainder of our time today, I want to get a little more specific. I want to push in on all of us a little bit so this isn't just a nice reflection on verses that we're not going to take seriously. Where do we believe that there's a greater greatness than love? Where do I believe there's a greater greatness? Where do you believe there's a greater greatness? As I thought about this, I wanted to think specifically about some temptations our fathers in the room face, 
We have some incredible fathers here who I'm glad I get to know personally and call friends. But these temptations that I think our fathers face, I'm going to use examples kind of for fathers, I think they're temptations we all face. So I think it still works. Here's a few. Few rival visions of greatness. First, consumerism. Consumerism says, greatness is found in what I have. The beauty of my perfectly manicured yard. The size of my home. The life I can provide for my family. The car I drive. The vacations I take. The money I make. Is that where greatness is found? Another one, individualism, which says greatness is found in my personal freedom. True greatness is having the power to decide your own destiny. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and no one can stop me. Is that true greatness? Here's a tricky word. Hedonism. Hedonism, which essentially means the pursuit of pleasure. Pleasure as an end. Greatness is found in what I feel. This could be the person who... This is kind of the one that most hits me. Wakes up thinking about the hobbies you love and how much fun you're going to have when you get to do this. This could also be the person who says, I'll find greatness through the person I'm sleeping with or dating or married to. Could be the person who says, my golf game, that's where I'm pursuing greatness. My card collection, my, wood, my workshop, my smoker that I make the best meat in the neighborhood on. The physical shape that I'm in, not my problem. The food you eat, the bourbon you like to sip, you name it, we can make it into a source of personal pleasure that we pursue as if it will offer greatness. Fourth, workaholism. Workaholism says greatness is found in what I do, the title you have, the respect you get from your subordinates, the success you can brag about, your reputation or image. Maybe it's even a social media image that you carefully curate so people see you a certain way. Or maybe tribalism, which says greatness is found in who I'm with. This is where your identity, your security, your peace is found because you belong to the right group. That could be your political party. That could be the sports team that you're willing to fork out tens of thousands of dollars a year, more power to you if you've got it, to support. It could be any group, but if your security is being found there, you could be at risk for tribalism. And then lastly, on a bit of a different note, there's cynicism. And cynicism says, greatness ain't all it's cracked up to be. There's no real greatness on this side of heaven. There's no real fulfillment that can be found in this life God has given us here. And I don't share these visions of greatness, these rival visions to try to condemn anyone or anything like that, but just to sound an alarm to say, there's plenty of times where my life doesn't look like I believe that love is the greatest. And maybe that's the case for you too. As you heard these rival visions of greatness, do any of them sound like ones you're tempted by? Greatness in what you have, in your personal freedom, in what you feel, in what you do, in who you're with. Do any describe what you wake up and go to sleep thinking about? Do you have a potential problem with a rival vision of greatness? All other visions of greatness, these included, will fade away, but the greatness of love will never fail. On this Father's Day, I, I think about my dad. I'm grateful. I'm very thankful. I had a very loving and good father. He was not a perfect man, but one thing he did do well is I never had any reason to doubt his love for God and his love for people which ties directly into the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We will fulfill that greatest commandment if we truly believe that the greatness of love is the greatness worth pursuing, That's the love, that the greatness of love is the greatness that will never fail. So I just want to ask you this morning, who has God put into your pathway for you to love? There are probably many people, but bring to mind now, even as you think about it, is there a coworker, a family member, a friend, a neighbor who you sense God is giving me an opportunity to love them? And then ask yourself, is my relationship with them filled with patience, kindness, contentment, quiet humility, honor, selflessness, peace, forgiveness, goodness, trust? Hope and perseverance. These are the qualities we talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7. It's a high calling, but true greatness is found in love, and the greatness of love never fails. 
thankfully, this is not something we have to pursue on our own. As Brian reminded us last week, we are invited to partner with the Holy Spirit. We are given the Holy Spirit because it is too much to do this on our own. But God draws near, and he wants to empower us with the wisdom and strength we need to love in this way. The Spirit that provided the gifts that the Corinthians were making into sources and signs of greatness is the same Spirit that's been given to you and me to help us love in this way. And as a way of just maybe offering a little bit of help for five to six days, I'm not committing to six, but at least five, this is all invitational. You have to opt in. We have this little thing you can sign up for this week. If you go to hcc.events and sign up for our event labeled True Greatness, here's what will happen. I will send you a push notification each day with just a few words, might be quotes from these verses, might be a short prayer you can say, might be a little reminder asking, where are you pursuing greatness? You don't have to. I'm probably not even going to see who all signed up. But if that can be a way to help you, I'd encourage you, just take the few minutes today or even now to sign up for those little reminders. I I thought of this just because, frankly, like, I know I need it. I've known about these verses for a long time. I don't think familiarity is my problem. The greatness of love never fails. And ultimately, where that leads us and where we're going to close this morning is the communion table. I'd like to invite a few uh, dads who I asked to help me just to come sit in the front row, dads, so we're ready. Uh, but we are going to respond now by, by receiving communion together, the Lord's Supper, if you will. The communion meal, if, if you haven't heard before, is really a reminder of the cross, the cross where Jesus suffered, where he died, where he allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be shed because of his love for the world. What's so important about the cross, and again, communion points us to the cross, is the cross corrects our vision. The cross gives us a true vision of greatness because the cross is the greatest example we have of the greatness of love. On the cross, Jesus, the Son of God, reveals the deep, deep love of our true Father, our Creator who knit you together in your mother's womb. Maybe you haven't had the best Father, and for that I am sorry, but I also offer the hope of the love of God revealed on the cross. Our true Father is good and faithful. Our true Father is willing to die for his children. He is a love that holds nothing back. That's how loved you are. That's our ultimate standard as we are called to love. The cross shows us that the greatness of love never fails. Just two chapters before 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and we had given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took uh, the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You are invited today to receive communion. We're going to pass these elements out. I'm going to ask you to hold them in your hands. We'll receive them all together at once. But what we're saying essentially when we receive communion is this is where we're putting our hope. We're putting our hope in Jesus and what he did on the cross, dying for my sin that I might have a relationship with him. There's going to be two different passes. We haven't done it that way in a while. The first time you'll receive bread, the second time you'll receive juice. Uh, If you are looking for one of the little combo cups from a food safety standpoint, they will come with the juice. So just bear with. You can still get your hands on that delicious little wafer that melts in your mouth. That's going to be in the second pass. Uh, As as they are distributing these elements, I'm going to have a few uh, little questions on the screen, just something to let our minds think about as we prepare to receive communion, about how this greatness found in love is being lived out in our lives. So if you will, take these moments in quiet, reflect, take the elements, hold on to them, and we'll receive them together in just a moment.